Hi, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Lauren Ania. I am an elder law and trust and estates attorney with the law firm of Ania Scanlon and Sirignano. Um, you are currently watching our Facebook Live series, uh, which we started a few weeks ago once we all became homebound for the most part uh, in order to continue to educate you and uh, provide you with updates as to things that are changing in the legal community as well as what you can do from the comfort of your home in order to continue to protect your estates, update your estate plan, and make any changes that you need. Uh, so we'll wait a few seconds while people continue to hop on and see uh, the presentation. Um, but the purpose of the presentation today and the topic that I'm going to be speaking on is powers of attorney um, and what that specific document is, what it can do for you and why you need one if you have not executed a power of attorney already. So let's hop into it. Um, so like I said, my name's Lauren and Nia. I am an associate at the firm. Um, and we're gonna talk about powers of attorney today. So a power of attorney is a document that allows you to appoint someone to handle your financial affairs. It allows you to appoint an agent um, or co-agents to essentially step into your shoes and do virtually anything you could do financially they would be able to do in the event you needed them. Um, why might you need someone to handle financial affairs for you? So it may be something as simple as you're out of the country and a document needs to be executed or something needs to be completed at the bank or a property sale needs to go through, or it can be something more complex or long-term such as incapacity. Um, a dementia diagnosis or Alzheimer's or a time arising where you can no longer handle your own financial affairs and you need someone else to do that for you. So, so uh, that's when it, it can be used and it's very important document for that purpose. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball, so we don't know when this document might need to come into play. So having it before any need for it arises is really the goal and one of the benefit, uh, benefits of executing a power of attorney. So like I said, it allows you to appoint someone to handle your financial affairs for you. And we'll talk a little bit about what type of things that agent can do for you and why. So one of the first things we're going to talk about is the different types of powers of attorney. Um, so one question that actually was asked to me uh, last week on another presentation was, what does durable mean? So you might have heard of a durable power of attorney. So that word durable means that the power of attorney lasts and survives the incapacity or disability of the principal. Um, it ensures that the power of attorney is not only valid when it's executed, but valid when it needs to be used, which might be when someone becomes incapacitated and unable to handle their own financial affairs themselves. Um, so that's really the, the reason to have a durable power of attorney. Um, it can be, be used after that principal becomes incapacitated. So a non-durable power of attorney is a power of attorney that ceases to be able to be used once someone becomes incapacitated. And non-durable powers of attorney are often utilized for things such as a real estate transaction where you're appointing, let's say, an attorney or another individual to execute legal documents for you, but you don't want them to continue to be able to handle your financial affairs indefinitely or after you become incapacitated. Um, that document might be very good for those short term utilization reasons uh, or to be utilized for the short term, but do not really assist and ensure a continuity in the planning and utilization and use of your finances if you were to become incapacitated or if something were to occur um, while um, you were incapacitated where someone would have to handle your own financial affairs. Um, so they're not really a good planning tool, the non-durable powers of attorney, if you're trying to plan for the future. A durable power of attorney is really something that you want. Um, and that durable power of attorney can be very broad or it can be very specific, depending on what type of provisions are in the power of attorney and what type of um, 
things that you give the agent authority to do. So uh, the types of power of attorney in New York, it's, it's governed by the general obligations law. And in 2009 and 2010, a really large overhaul of the law that uh, governs powers of attorney was enacted. And a statutory short form was enacted as well. So the statutory short form is really the form that everyone utilizes and must be utilized in order for a power of attorney to be valid in the state of New York. And that statutory short form can be modified and broadened based on what you wanted to say. So some of the uh, general provisions include real estate transactions, filing tax returns, opening a bank account, closing a bank account, paying your bills, handling the day-to-day -day things that you would typically need to handle yourself during your life. The authorities and powers can also then be modified and broadened to include anything else that an agent might need um, to do for you, such as uh, creating a revocable living trust, uh, enrolling you in uh, Medicaid, doing a Medicaid application, speaking with other financial uh, institutions. Uh, there's also other provisions that can be very important, such as provisions dealing with digital assets. When you have assets that are on a solely digital platform, like many of us do today, or you have digital devices that are password protected, email accounts, um, accounts with all of your photographs and videos on it, your iTunes account, things like that, the agent under your power of attorney can have authorization and the ability to access if the power of attorney uh, gives them the specific provisions allowing them to access that type of material and information as well. Um, so that is what a power of attorney is. It's really a document that allows you to give someone else access. Um, and like I said, there's the statutory short form in New York. Now that statutory short form is really part one, as I like to call it, of the power of attorney. There's also something called a statutory gifts rider. And the gifts rider is really the power of a portion of the power of attorney or a rider or addendum to the power of attorney uh, that must be executed in conjunction with the statutory short form and gives your agent authority to make gifts of your assets, to move money out of your name. And without this gifts rider, the agent under your power of attorney has no authority to gift your assets. Um, the gifts rider also allows for either a very broad gifting power or very stringent gifting power, or strict power. So for instance, if you only check off and initial certain boxes or provisions in that gifts rider, your agent might only be able to make gifts to immediate family members or might only be able to make gifts in certain amounts. Uh, typically the amount is $15,000 per person per year, which is the um, annual exemption amount uh, for tax purposes for gifting. Uh, so it may be limited to that. You may not want the gifting power to be limited to that. Why might you not want the power to be limited? So let's say that you're doing Medicaid planning or you're doing any sort of asset protection planning and money has to get out of the person who's incapacitated its name. Without the ability to gift their, their funds out of their name, you may not be able to uh, transfer the assets out of their name, or you would need to do it in very, very small uh, provisions. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just getting two questions here. I'll get to those after. Thank you for posting some questions. So with the, with the power of attorney and the statutory gifts rider, you may not be able to um, transfer all of their money or a large portion of their money or do more complex planning if the statutory gifts rider does not give the authority for someone to do that type of gifting. Um, and that type of gifting can become very important when someone needs Medicaid or when more complex estate planning is being done and the individual didn't do that type of planning uh, before they became incapacitated and can no longer do that themselves. Um, so for some of you who are younger um, or don't know much about a power of attorney, you may be thinking to yourself, why do I need this document? I have full control over my finances. I handle everything myself. If not, I have my spouse. They can handle things for me. I think I'm covered. I don't need it. Well, 
like I said, we don't have a crystal ball. So if you're unable to handle your own finances because you've either become ill or God forbid you had a traumatic brain injury or God forbid some sort of situation occurred where you can no longer handle your own finances and you no longer have capacity to do so without having a power of attorney, sometimes the only option is to petition the court for someone to be appointed your guardian. Now, that is a very long, it's a costly process. Uh, it's sometimes a difficult process, especially because it includes taking away someone's rights and um, having them legally uh, stated as incapacitated. Um, so without having a power of attorney or a broadly drafted power of attorney, you can sometimes, unfortunately, put yourself in a position where you instead need to go to the court in order to get certain authorities, some of which they may not allow, depending on the situation, especially when it comes to gifting authorities. Oftentimes, we see that in uh, Article 81 guardianships, the judge may not allow for gifting of the individual's assets because it's not deemed in their best interest. Um, while if you had executed a power of attorney, you can include those broad gifting powers. Um, and just a note on those gifting powers, uh, whenever gifting is done pursuant to a power of attorney, there is always a in the best interest of the principal or the person creating the power of attorney. So all gifts, all transfers out of that individual's name must be done in that person's best interest. So whether it's in their best interest for advanced estate planning purposes or for tax planning purposes in order for them to become eligible for Medicaid benefits, it's always on that in their best interest standard. Um, so other reasons why you may want to have a power of attorney. Without it, it takes time for someone to become a guardian. Your bills may not get paid. Other legal actions may not be able to be taken on your uh, behalf in a timely manner. Documents may not be able to be signed. Um, the other benefit of having a power of attorney in that type of situation is it really puts you in the driver's seat even when you no longer have capacity. When you make the decision as to who you want to handle your financial affairs for you, you're making that decision. You're not leaving it up to whoever petitions the court to act as your guardian. You're not leaving it up to a judge. You're making the decision as to who you want to handle your affairs what type of things you want them to do, and you're allowing that document to be executed by you at a time that you have the capacity to do so. Um, so that is a really important reason to execute a power of attorney, to not wait to execute those that document. Um, so let's talk a little bit about agents and the person that you're appointing to handle these financial affairs for you. So an agent is a fiduciary. It's someone that's acting on your behalf and has to uphold their fiduciary duties, needs to make sure they're doing things in your best interest. Um, you can have one agent. You can have co-agents. You can also appoint successor agents to act. Oftentimes, I find that my clients typically will appoint a spouse to act as their agent under their power of attorney. They might have their children act as agent under their power of attorney or a close family friend or um, a close trusted advisor uh, that they, they feel comfortable giving this type of authority to. Uh, with co-agents, you can determine and decide whether you want those two agents to be able to act separately from one another or if you want them to have to act together. So often clients may want, let's say they're, they're appointing their children to act as agent. They may want their two children to act uh, together because they wanna have a check and a balance. They wanna make sure that both children are making decisions together, they're talking to one another when they're deciding what type of things need to be done on uh, your behalf. Um, or due to, um, Let's say your children live on opposite sides of the country uh, for efficiency purposes. You may want them to be able to act separately. You may know that they will talk with one another and you want one of your children to be able to do things without the other person being present or without their authorization or signature. So that's up to you when you execute your power of attorney, what decisions you want to make. 
And when choosing who should act as this agent under your power of attorney, it's really important to choose someone that you trust um, and someone that you have confidence in who will uphold what your wishes are, who knows what your wishes are in regards to your finances. Uh, sometimes that might be, you know, let's say you have three children. Perhaps it's a child that is the oldest. Perhaps it's a child that's more financially savvy or you have confidence in that will make good financial decisions for you. So there are decisions that need to be made when determining who you want to act as the agent under your power of attorney. But again, that's a decision that you get to make, which is the benefit of having this document. Um, so we talked about the gifts rider a little bit and how that's a very important portion of the power of attorney. Often uh, clients sometimes get a little bit concerned about that gifting power. Why would I want my children to have authority to take all my money and gift it to themselves, for instance? Again, that's where that best interest standard comes into play. And another thing to point out with the power of attorney is while we recommend doing a durable power of attorney that is inexistent presently, meaning that you are presently appointing an agent who has authority as of the moment that the document is signed, that doesn't mean that they need to use that authority. And that doesn't mean that you, as the person handling your own finances, loses any authority. You still get to make all of your financial decisions until it's either decided that you want your agent under your power of attorney to act for you. Let's say that you have gotten to an advanced age and you just don't want to deal with paying your bills anymore. Or let's say that it's been determined that you're incapacitated at that point, then your agent under your power of attorney can start acting. Uh, some individuals are, are a little confused, I would say, or become un uncertain as to whether they want their agents to have the authority presently. Um, and I always discuss with them, well, you don't need to have them utilize this power of attorney presently. In fact, you don't even need to give it to them presently. Uh, while we may have them sign as the agent so that it's a, it's a fully completed and executed document, oftentimes clients may have us hold on to the power of attorney for them and not release it to the agent they appoint unless they give us permission to do so or until it's deemed by a physician that they no longer have capacity to handle their own financial affairs themselves. So there are ways to safeguard the document in order to ensure that it's ready, it's available, it has the provisions that it needs, but it is not um, in the wrong hands at the wrong time. Now, you should always still appoint someone who you trust. So you don't want the reason uh, that you don't want your agent to have the power of attorney being that you don't trust them to hold on to that document and only use it at an appropriate time. You should always, if that's the case, maybe reflect as to who you're appointing as the agent under your power of attorney and ensure that it is someone that you trust. So some of the provisions that we discussed that are very important are provisions that allow an agent to continue handling your financial affairs for you. Um, and a few provisions that I want to touch on again are those that relate to estate planning and Medicaid planning, because I see that that's often where these powers of attorneys come into play and where it's extremely important to have durable uh, powers of attorney executed with the statutory gifts gifting, uh, st statutory gifts rider with broad gifting authority as well. And I'd say that the majority of the time that we're seeing these documents be used is when, God forbid, mom or dad become incapacitated and there's money in their name. And unfortunately, they need either help at home or they need to go into a nursing home. And when that type of situation occurs, the power of attorney can be an invaluable document in order to allow the agents to continue to handle mom and dad's affairs, but also apply for Medicaid benefits for them, transfer money out of their name in order for them to apply for benefits. If they're going into a nursing home and money needs to be transferred and a crisis plan needs to be done or any sort of complex planning needs to be done, the agent under the power of attorney can essentially do all of those things. Um, so it becomes an extremely important document at that point to allow that type of planning to continue to be done as if the person was doing it it's themselves. Um, 
some of you might be saying, well, I have joint owners on my accounts. So I have someone that has access to my bank accounts. I don't need a power of attorney. Someone else has access. Well, while that, that is true, you have someone else with access to your money. If God forbid that person were to pass away and now that money's in your name alone again, again, now it's in your name alone. And if you do not have capacity, a power of attorney would be the only way for an individual to obtain access to that funds unless a court proceeding is commenced and a guardian is appointed. Um, so that's one thing. I have other clients that say, well, I'm this person's spouse. So if, if there's money in their name alone, let's say that my husband, Brian, has a bank account and there's money in his name alone. And if God forbid he isn't able to handle his own finances, if my name's not on that account, even though I'm his wife, I don't have access to that money. So unless I have a power of attorney appointing me as his agent, I can't access that money for him. Um, another important reason to have a power of attorney, even if you have joint owners, is for things such as contacting the Social Security office, um, executing any other legal documents, changing beneficiaries on a life insurance policy, or creating a joint bank account. All of these types of things that you may not think need to be done on a day-to-day -day basis might arise in a situation or circumstance that has not yet been foreseen. Um, so I'll tell you, our power of attorney is 14 pages long and covers quite a bit of different modifications because we've seen certain things arise over the years, whether it's with our clients or through different laws that come up or through research that need to be included in a power of attorney in order to safeguard the individual and ensure that anything that needs to be done is being done uh, properly. So what can you do now? So if you don't have a power of attorney, it's important to execute one, to determine who you may want to have named as an agent under your power of attorney. And actually, even though we're all in our homes and unable to meet with an attorney face to face, um, you can still execute a power of attorney now. At least in New York, Governor Cuomo, uh, by his executive orders uh, 202.7 and 202.14, which were uh, enacted back in March and more recently, I believe it was April 7th, um, you can now do, we can now do remote notarization and remote witnessing of estate planning documents. So this is huge where we can actually execute a power of attorney and other estate planning documents for you from the comfort of your own home and get that process rolling, um, especially where we're in such an uncertain time um, and these powers of attorney are even more important today than they have been, I'd say, in the past. Um, so if you haven't executed one, it's something that you still can do now, even though we are all confined to our home. Um, and what if you already have a power of attorney? Do you need to update it? Do you need to do anything else for it? Um, the the answer is yes, you should always be updating the updating and looking at these documents. Um, like I had said earlier, in 2009 and 2010, there was a huge overhaul to uh, the general obligations law and the power of attorney. So if you have not executed a power of attorney since then, you, you should uh, look into executing a new power of attorney, ensuring that it has that statutory gifts rider included with it and ensure that it has the provisions that you want. Another thing to, to look into is whether or not the agent that you've appointed as your agent under the power of attorney is someone that you still want to act. Um, especially for my younger clients, their agents are often brothers or sisters or close friends or other family members, sometimes even their parents because their children are minors. If your children are now older, you may want them to act as the agents under your power of attorney or as the successor agents because those are the people that know the most about your financial situation and the people who would likely be helping you in, in a situation where you cannot handle your own financial affairs. Um, so again, if you have not uh, executed a power of attorney or if you have not reviewed it in, in, in the past five, 10 years, I strongly urge you to take a look at your power of attorney and see uh, whether it's still 
states what you want it to state and if it's broadly drafted enough in order to cover all of the different provisions and scenarios that I've discussed throughout this presentation. Um, a power of attorney is really just one of many estate planning documents that can be done um, and should be done. And, you know, it's funny, I always tell the story whenever I do a presentation that um, I'm often a great case of a shoemaker's kid that goes without shoes when it comes to these documents. I have all of them now, but a few years ago, I was uh, boarding a plane to go on my honeymoon with my husband. And... I turned to him and I go, Brian, I didn't execute powers of attorney for us before we left. And he looked at me like I was crazy because why was I thinking that on my way on my honeymoon? But if I'm not thinking about it, there's definitely other people out there that are not thinking about it as well. And it's a document that you really need uh, anytime since you're 18, because once you turn age 18, your parents cannot handle your own finances for you. There isn't somebody else to you know, access those bank accounts for you. Um, so everyone should have a power of attorney and have appointed someone to act as an agent under a power of attorney, given those circumstances. Um, a healthcare proxy is also a very important document, especially now a HIPAA form uh, to allow an agent under a healthcare proxy to obtain medical records. And of course, a last will and testament, as well as other estate planning documents. So let's take a look at some of the questions that have popped up. Um, Someone asked, where can an attorney get these forms online? Um, there are the statutory short forms on the New York State Bar Association website. Um, let's see, if I'm power of attorney for my mom, can I access her bank accounts if needed, or is there another legal document needed? No, a power of attorney is the document that's needed in order to access bank accounts for another person. So if you're the agent under someone's power of attorney, and that individual uh, either requests you to handle their financial affairs for them or needs you to because they no longer have capacity, that's the document that you need to uh, provide to the bank in order to obtain access to that fund. Uh, some banks want to see the original document. Others may be okay with seeing a copy. It depends on the bank's policy. With a durable power of attorney, how technically would you use that document to gain access to funds in a checking account if you are the agent? Do you sign the check as power of attorney? Um, so the first thing would be to access and contact the bank. So while you have the authority to act as agent, you need to provide proof of that authority to the financial institution for you to utilize that authority on a specific bank account. So if the power, the bank account is in mom's name alone and you're the agent under the power of attorney, just by virtue of having that document, you do not have the ability to sign checks um, and transfer money out of that account. You would first need to provide the power of attorney to the financial institution, um, make sure that they add you as agent under the power of attorney on the bank account. Um, another important thing to add is that a power of attorney only lasts until someone's through someone's lifetime if it's durable. Um, so at the moment someone passes away, the power of attorney no longer can be utilized to handle that person's finances. And if the account remains in that person's name alone, it's an estate asset of that individual. So that's sometimes where more complex planning, additional estate planning may come into place in order to not only allow you you to ensure that some that you have access to the person's money, but possibly using revocable trusts or other planning mechanisms in order to avoid probate as well. Mm -hmm. uh, is it recommended to change power of attorney to a durable power of attorney? Uh, it, de it depends um, on whether or not the power of attorney is durable to begin with. So the document itself would state whether it's a durable power of attorney. If it's not durable, I would recommend executing a durable power of attorney. Uh, since our mortgage and bank accounts are in both my husband and my name, is it still important to have this power of attorney? Absolutely. Like I had said before, while bank accounts may be in joint name, if God forbid one of those individuals were to pass away, it's now in a person's name alone. So only one person now has access to that account. And if that one person were to become incapacitated and no power of attorney was executed, then the only way to obtain control over those funds is through a guardianship proceeding. Um, and, and 
even more so while the bank account is only one caveat or one portion of your entire financial um, kind of platform and, and finances, uh, there's other things that may need to be done. Like I said, filing taxes, uh, changing beneficiaries on a life insurance policy, doing other estate planning or applying for Medicaid, anything that would require someone's signature that deals with some sort of financial decision, uh, an agent under a power of attorney would be able to do if that power of attorney is broadly drafted enough. So I think our time is about up. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming to today's presentation. We will be continuing to do these weekly on Wednesdays at two o'clock. Um, we have attorneys uh, that are available for consultations and are working remotely, um, but please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions about the presentation or would like to discuss uh, any of these types of estate planning documents and how uh, you can continue to uh, protect your estate and plan for your future, especially during these uncertain times. Uh, so I hope that your families are safe and healthy and that everyone continues uh, to do well. I do wanna give a shout out to all of the essential workers out there, the first responders, the nurses, especially in our resident nursing homes, um, the Yonkers Police Department. My husband's a police officer and I know they're working very hard as well as all of the nurses and, and nursing home staff. Um, so again, my name's Lauren Ania. Uh, I'm with Ania Scanlon and Serignano. You can contact me directly at 914-948-1500, or you can email me at l.ania, that's E-N-E-A, at esslawfirm.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope to see you all next week.